Hey guys, welcome to No Talks Allowed. I am your uh, weekly host, Josh. We've, I, I'm saying weekly because we've uploaded weekly. We've only missed uh, one episode. I believe two. Two episodes. Uh, yeah. We're supposed to be weekly, but anyways, uh, this is our 24th episode, which means that we have done 24 shows that somebody has listened to, and yeah. to help, and because you have listened to our show. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to this other guy that joins me with the, on the show. His name is Big Pod, and uh, he's going to he's going to explain to you why you enjoy listening to this show. <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. I, I have no idea either. So uh, we pulled in this this other guy to help explain explain to us, who has probably had never actually listened to our show before. Uh, this uh, this is Noel. Hi there. I'm Noel. I'm a guest on the show. Uh, uh, full transparency. Yes, I haven't had a chance to listen to it. It's been a pretty busy week for me, so <laughs> I intended hey, to. That that's perfectly fine. <laughs> it, it's perfectly fine. It, it's it's perfectly acceptable. So, uh, Big Pod. Yep. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we have finally gotten rain. <laughs> we got two and a half inches of rain Ooh. on Monday. Nice. Here in Europe, there is a lot more rain. Okay. And nobody. Well, just likes to let it. you know, this has went. This has went from the third driest uh, summer on record in the state of Ohio to the. I believe now we're the seventh driest summer in the state of Ohio. You, you did good. <laughs> yes, we we did real good. We got a little bit of water, but anyways, uh. I went on to my RSS feeds today, and it looks like that Ubuntu is finally doing something that uh, you know some of these other pack, uh, these other pack, uh, sandbox packaging formats should probably take a little bit more seriously. And Ubuntu twenty four point ten is looking like it's going to introduce a graphical tool for managing snap permissions. Nice. Right now, yeah. uh, I know I know for flat packs, uh, there are some third party applications that do in fact exist. Yeah, one of them being implemented directly into KDE Control Center or whatever that mess of million menu settings is called. Uh, yeah, it's called the uh, KCM dash flat pack dash settings. Yes. I think that's what it's called. But uh, so uh, the Pharonix article, which is going to be linked in the description of the, of the show notes here, uh, has a couple of images of what this looks like. And uh, for your individual snap, and uh, what it's looking like is that it's actually going to be like a security prompt of where when you try to do something in your application, it's going to pop up a window sort of like that uh, policy kit window that you see every now and then when you're when you're doing something that maybe you should think twice about uh, on your system and finally uh, somebody done it the right way yeah the, the and for example like say that if you're using your firefox web browser installed as a snap and you're looking for something in your like your downloads folder uh like a png image like what's shown in the in here it's going to pop up it's just like uh hey uh, Firefox wants to have right access to this folder. Uh, there's a little button for like about this application, which probably useful somewhere. Uh, and then you have radio options for uh, giving Firefox access to everything in the home folder, just the downloads folder, everything in a subdirectory of the folder that you're actively working in, only a requested file, all files of that of that uh, file type. So in this example, a PNG image. So you just give it access to all PNG images on the, on the user system, or a custom path pattern. And uh, it looks like that uh, you even have checkboxes for read, write, and execute permissions. And here's the important thing: duration. So you can always give it access, or just this one time. Nice. So that sounds. They're going closer to Android model than Flatpak is currently, which is really, really, really good. 
yeah, this is actually a really good idea. And uh, I'm starting to think that if no one was to implement this uh, for like uh, flat packs, because I know that the Gnome Foundation really is push has pushed flat packs in the past for Gnome. Uh, this is something that they could that they should <clears throat> that I personally think that they should actually seriously consider. Yeah. Problem with flat packs and why they don't get this stuff implemented. They're always going on that crutch of soon we're gonna have portals and everything will be better automatically. Problem is how long have portals been in development and how many troubles they have been in. Yeah, that and uh when when you implement the portal, well now uh the desk the desktop environment needs to support the portal. Uh, not necessarily the, application needs to support the portal, not yeah, desktop the desktop environment. The application needs to support the portal. Which yes. then we're talking about legacy applications where they may or may not uh be yes. updated to support that. Perfectly it would be if the runtime itself, so bubble wrap and flatback as the engine would be able to catch those requests which they can do and show such dialogues again uh think about android of old when or even android of the day android of old means that the first time you run the application it asks you for certain permissions or android of new when like you start using certain permission it asks you for that permission, whether it be GPS, whether it be file access, and similar. Yeah, so uh, this looks like that's actually already pack packaged up in the Snapcraft uh, repositories. Nice. So if you switch your Snap Snap channel from from a release to candidate, so uh, sudo sudo snap refresh snap d dash dash channel equals candidate. Uh, you install two packages of the desktop dash security dash center and the prompting dash client. And uh, that should get, get this working on an existing uh, Ubuntu or Snap uh, system, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't have Snap installed right now, so uh, I can't Not test right. this. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> been out but, of the ubuntu world for a while so <laughs> yeah, same it, and it's not that i have a hatred of snaps it's just that uh i don't have any snaps i particularly want to install right now so that's why i just don't have snap the installed on my system i do have a couple flat packs because you know uh i already had flat pack on the system so we'll just turn on flat hub and go mm -hmm. uh and uh i might just mess around with this just a little bit because uh, i'm super I'm super curious about this. And in a little bit more news, uh, Gnome has announced recently that they are looking for a new executive director. Interesting. So uh, this uh, career, uh, the, it's not, this is not a technical uh, position. Uh, instead, this is all about engaging with the community and fundraising. Yeah. As well as a little bit of advocacy, because you know uh, they are just an. This is an executive role, so uh, you d you don't. So uh, the the previous person that that worked in this was a bit of a contro controversial figure. Uh, I already forget her name. <laughs> uh, Holly Million, I believe. It is. Uh, yes, uh, Holly Million, uh, where uh, the first thing that you could find for her was that she was a shaman. <laughs> And that she, she used, worked with uh, these nonprofit charities in the past, and that's how she got the got the role. So I imagine that the bar for this position is not particularly high. Yeah. But uh, what what they're requesting specifically is five years of experience in nonprofit or organizational management. So uh. If you worked the desk position at a, at a at a big company and you had some executive privileges, you probably qualify for this. Uh, of course, you got to be able to communicate and be persuasive because you know you got to sell people on this stuff too, and uh, you got to have proven experience in fundraising and partnership development. Which you know, uh, I would prefer that the gnome's executive director actually has uh, experience in that to begin with. Yeah. 
But uh, Big Pot, are you interested in fill- in signing up for this position? No, I know you just know him. Yeah, I just know, him, but I'm I-, I am a leader, but not that kind of leader. I'm a technical leader. <laughs> it sounds like okay. a challenging position for sure. Like I've worked with uh, previous experience, professional experience. I worked in small businesses, and a lot of the clients that we would work with in managed services were nonprofits and um, just the challenges that they run into for their IT needs as well as just their day-to-day stuff yeah. is very, very different than what we run into in the in the commercial sector or the government sector. They're just a whole different animal. Um, it's a really fascinating thing and I, I wish them the best of luck with whoever they, whoever they find to fill that position because it's a tough job. <laughs> so well yeah you gotta sell people on on using gnome mm-hmm. <laughs> the best <laughs> Which, uh, environment so not much of a sell <laughs> yeah uh so uh you're you're also kind of got to talk people into uh using linux and open source software uh not that's the hard one yeah that that's the true hard one yep. and then and then you gotta keep them on gnome too hopefully uh, that way you can continue to get their money in the future. So uh, good luck. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, to – because, you know, uh, somebody pegged us somewhere as a security podcast. We 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 have some security news for everybody. Uh, this was posted on uh, the 11th of September, uh, just a few days uh, prior to this recording. Uh, for, for context and rec- – for context, if you're not, if you're listening to this uh, as the episode releases, we are recording this on the 14th. Yes. So uh, this is not breaking news by any means, but it is news that is worth talking about. It might have been once breaking news. Uh, uh, yeah, it was definitely breaking news three days ago. But uh, Harris, the CEO and founder of the security watch firm Watchtower, decided he was going to black hat. Uh, a tech conference here in the United States, and uh, if you if you know anything about uh, IT security, you've probably heard of the Black Hat Conference because that's that's where you go with the burner phone and the burner laptop yeah. and nothing else. <laughs> and uh, anyways, he uh, he uh, did some watching of uh, D- of DNS uh, prov- top level DNS providers and found that recently. Uh, the, let's see, what is, what, what is this company's name here? Uh, okay. It doesn't say in, it doesn't say in this article, but the domain dot mobile registry dot net, uh, is, uh, the domain in question here. It was an authoritative who, who is server for the dot mobi domain, which is a top level domain used to typically indicate that a, a website is optimized for mobile devices. Uh, I haven't seen one of these domains in a while, but I know that they used to be really popular for like mobile websites. Interesting. Well, anyways, at some point, it's not precisely clear when, but uh, the the uh, top level domain server changed its domain from who is dot mobile registry dot net to who is dot nic dot mobi, and uh, well. Uh, Harris, uh, the CEO, was uh, re- was taking a retreat to his Las Vegas hotel room. He noticed that the old domain expired. So, because this guy happens <coughs> to be at Black Hat, he uh, registered the domain name under his name, and he spun up his own do- uh, top uh, domain server, and immediately got seventy six thousand. Uh, get request from unique IP addresses. O- o- over the course of five days, uh, it received roughly 2.5 million queries. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if I was a top-level domain provider and I wanted to change the domain name of my uh, Please, server, uh, yeah. do not. I'm. Pr- do not let it expire. Don't let it expire. Or, you know, if you're going to let it expire, make sure you sell it before it expires to somebody 
who you can trust to maintain it. Because uh, this could have been very, very bad. Because it is always DNS's fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know that is nothing better. Yeah. Uh, that's about uh, realistically all that there is to that article. But, you know, ju just a reminder out there. If you're going to, uh, you know, register a domain, make sure you know who controls that controls the top-level domain. Yeah, and, and make uh, sure who controls the who is server. Whether yeah, you know, also it, quite important. Yeah, ju just remember, at one point, Google had to pay somebody $10 million because they let Google.com expire. <laughs> 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 but uh, I think we're ready for a bit of a nerdy chat now. <laughs> and uh, we we have a big pod who for the longest time has been using this uh, wonderful operating system called a, called a Fedora Atomic Desktop. That's what they call it nowadays. Uh, if you don't know what an Atomic Desktop is, think of Fedora Silverblue. Yes. But it's not just Silverblue anymore. It's a whole family of things, so they had to give it a different name. Yeah. And uh, Big Pod has been talking about this thing for like 25 episodes now, 24 episodes now. <laughs> and uh, he, it has been slowly back in my mind here. And it's like, you know what? We need to get a guest on this podcast. And the Big Pod is just like, Big Pod just messages me and goes like, I know just the person to talk to. Unfortunately, it's not George Castro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his less attractive replacement, like I said in my uh, Fedora Flock conference talk. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so before Noel. we continue, I have a, have a bit of a disclaimer. It's important to know that I do hold a title with the Universal Blue Project. It's Universal Blue... Uh, Contributor Emeritus, which for those of you who do not speak Latin means I contributed in past. Uh, yeah, and uh, I am not a contributor. Uh, and I'm not an active user, but I have messed around with it. <laughs> now, uh, once again, welcome to Noel. And first... First task I have for you, convince Josh that Universal Blue is the right thing for him. <laughs> well, um, that is definitely going to be an uphill challenge based on our, our uh, previous uh, talk right before the show, but I will, I will do my best. Um, I Floor think is yours. I appreciate it. Um, so... For those who don't know me, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. So I'm Noel Miller. Um, I am currently a project manager and core contributor at the Universal Blue Project. Um, I work on basically our main images, which are essentially batteries included images that are downstream from the Fedora Silverblue, Fedora Kino White, basically any images that they publish in an OCI container format we have basically made quality of life changes in order to be able to improve the experience for an average desktop user. So, um, and what we are more well known for is our more opinionated changes that we have made, which um, I call our downstream projects. Um, those are Bluefin, which is a GNOME-based desktop that is meant for the Chromebook type audience that is just trying to utilize their computer to do basic tasks, whether it's web browsing or whatever the case, basic office editing, that sort of deal. Um, we have a DX version, which is a developer experience version of Bluefin, which includes tooling for folks who are cloud native developers. So the desire there is it includes things like VS Code, it includes things like um, Box Buddy, Tixis, which is a um, terminal editor, or not an editor, a terminal, which is basically meant to um, integrate with container-based workflows, and a lot of other tooling that I could spend literally a half an hour talking about. So um, 
And the other projects that we also have, Aurora is the KDE version of Bluefin, so it includes both a normal Aurora as well as Aurora DX. So if you want that more Windows-like experience rather than, you know, uh, that GNOME slash Mac kind of experience is the way that I describe it, then, um, then you have something available there. The other um, project, which is our most popular project by far in regards to name recognition as far as pulls from our um, repos, is a project called Bazite. Um, that project ships uh, both GNOME versions as well as KDE, and the major differentiator with Bazite versus um, something like Silver Blue or Kino White is that it is meant for playing video games. It is designed to be able to work on Steam Deck, Ally X, and Ally, which are um, Asus's projects. And then they also have the Legion Go, which is Lenovo's attempt at a handheld, and a bunch of other different types of handhelds. So there's like the GPD ones, there's a million other ones that I can't even remember all of the names, but those are the main ones is the Steam Deck, the Legion Go, and the Ally X. Those are the big um, focus currently um, for development. So, but you can also run it on your desktop as well. So normal Bazite, which is the image that you download, if you go to the website bazite.gg, it actually walks you through how to do everything. Um, basically pick for what type of computer you're using whether it's a laptop what manufacturer because there are certain types of drivers and things that are needed in order to be able to get a good out of the box experience it's a way to walk you through and basically set it up for your device so that's bazite which um in my talk for fedora flock which i presented at this year i talked about the fact that we as the Universal Blue project, and specifically with the downstream projects, which are Bluefin and Bazite, our target is not creating images. Our target is creating experiences, which is kind of a lame way to describe the idea that we want to have an out-of-a-box experience that works for most people's use case. And the reason for that is because I find that people, when they're setting up Fedora traditionally, have that problem where it's like, oh, I got to set up RPM Fusion in order to be able to get access to more software. I have to set up FlatHub if I'm going to do things that way because the Fedora traditional flat pack Fedora repos don't include as much software in them. I need to set up codecs in order to be able to watch Netflix on my device. I need to set up, there is a laundry list of items and things that need to be set up. And then there's also tweaks to the kernel and other things too sometimes that you need to do in order to be able to get hardware working with your computer. So in the case of Bazite, for example, if you're a gamer, and want to play video games, you have to set up specific software in order to be able to get your game controller working. The way that we're able to ship Bazite is that we include all of that in the image itself. So out of the box, you install it on your computer and your game controller should hopefully work. And if it doesn't, we want to know so that we can fix that problem for you. So that's kind of the desire of the project is that like day to day, there's not a lot of things that for me, and I consider myself a power user or a developer type user, which is doing tinkering and a lot of, you know, different types of things. But day to day, I just want my computer to work and I want it to work the way I expected it worked yesterday. And the thing that I feel great about and why I switched to the atomic model and why I will never consider going back to what I consider as a traditional Linux desktop is because of that reliability that if I have a problem the next day and I ran an update and for some reason something broke, I have the capability of being able to roll back to the previous image that I was just using. 
And that is stability that I will not change through the world. It's built into the concept of how this stuff is delivered. And that for me is extremely important is that stability and reliability. And also that good out of the box experience that I can just get it working. Now, I understand that Bazite, Bluefin, Aurora may not be everybody's speed. As a traditional Linux user, we want to tinker the heck out of our system. We want to make it work exactly the way that we want to work. And so the nice thing is, is that the images that we build off of, that we build Bazite, Bluefin, Aurora, you know, all of our different downstreams. We also have Ucore, which is a batteries included version of CoreOS. Um, which takes a lot of the work out of setting up NVIDIA, ZFS, all of those cool things that you do as a sysadmin, saves you a ton of effort and work because someone has already basically put together the image to make it work properly. Um, and so you wanna tinker and you wanna create your own system and you wanna customize it exactly the way that you want. And so we have a solution there, which is that you can utilize one of our image templates. You can build everything in GitHub and essentially create your own experience of what you want your computer to look like and how you want it to function. And you get all of the benefits of that reliability and that stability. And so that's my pitch is that no matter what level of user of your computer, whether you just want to take something that's out of the box or you want to make changes to it, all you have to understand how to do is to utilize a container file and utilize GitHub and you can do that. Last thing I'll say is that I actually on my desktop do not use just Bazite itself. Because I'm a developer slash power user, I need tooling that Bazite does not ship out of the box. And so I actually created my own custom image based off of Bazite. And all I need to do inside of my container file is say from Bazite and then add a run command to basically install the software that I need on top. And that's it. That's all I had to do in order to be able to get my desktop to look exactly the way because Bazate has done 90% of the work for me. I just wanted that last 10% of stuff, which is not very much, in order to be able to get the system to work the way that I expect. So that's my pitch. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that, is a, that is a solid pitch. And uh, I'll let you know that I have uh, delved, delved down the realm of making my own images in the past. Uh, uh, I did one prior to me discovering your image builder, and I did, and I have one after I discovered an image builder. I, I did briefly attempt to to uh, mess around with Blue Build, and uh, I very quickly gave up on Blue Build, and I just went back to the standard image template. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> so, Blue Build uh, is a cool project, and but it is very opinionated in a way that if you're familiar with containers and familiar with the way that you can do things, for me personally, it's the reason why we split the project from the project is that yeah. they wanted to do things one way, we wanted to do it a different way. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's open source software. That's just going to happen, mm -hmm. and yep. uh, so. Uh, I think if you watch like the the uh, U Blue Discord, I I've hopped in there occasionally, and I and uh, I and I know that uh, there's a couple of people that are a fan of like my HTPC image, of which uh, Big Pod, I did send you a couple of links if you could forward those yep. to uh, Noel for me. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the these are these are two of uh, my my little projects of me figuring out the system, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is an HTPC image. It, there, it, there is it supposed is, to be a video uh, about there, there, it or how to make it, but uh, the, the creators of the video are the same people who make this podcast, so you know um, the prof <laughs> professionality level of that. Uh, we, we we did this before we knew how to what we were doing. So yes. uh, mm -hmm. so. I, I have found out very quickly that when it comes to like an HTPC image, I don't need a lot just to run Cody. So mm -hmm. uh, I had to, so uh, we 
I'm just pulling from the base image, which is minimum viable, here's an operating system. Mm -hmm. I don't know how vi how minimum viable it actually is, but it's the smallest image I could find. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see where I'm set, where if you just look in the container file, uh, I'm specifying that, hey, I need these repositories enabled out of RPM Fusion. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's just set up Cage with Cody and a couple Cody pl plugins. Uh, NFS Utils and Samba because, you know, we want to be reasonable people. And Podman just in case. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, because it doesn't include these things by default, I wanted my Tmux. I wanted my HTOP. I wanted the Bmon for, like, network monitoring. And a couple text editors because you know uh, it turns out that for door that the base image doesn't have any text editors by default, even yep. nano. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Base is really base. Yeah, it it is a minimum viable operating system. It is minimum viable. Exact. You're exactly <laughs> correct on that. Yep. Yeah, and uh, then and basically what I'm doing while I'm explaining this is I is I open up the container file. We're gonna have a link for this project in the description of the show because that. Because this is really just a, an example of how basic you can be with this, and mm -hmm. because it is literally just a container file. If you've messed around with with building Docker images or in the past, you've probably looked in these before. And uh, I have a few run commands. I have a couple copy commands because you know uh, I'm writing system D services to when you boot the computer, it mm -hmm. boots straight into to a cage session that launches Cody, because it's a home theater computer. You need a home theater environment, and Cody is the best one. And Cody just needs something to run inside of. So Cage is just a Ki is a Wayland compositor that is just for Kiosk, mm -hmm. uh, and that's all it is. And uh, that that is essentially all that this container is. Uh, if you've looked at like these Cody operating systems before, like uh, OSMC or Libre Elec, this is an alternative for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I. Uh, last what I was messing around with on this was actually making a deployable ISO image, mm -hmm. of which there is a functional one that I've been <laughs> able to make, but I see this as an appliance operating system, mm -hmm. so I don't want to force a user to generate user accounts manually. I want those automatically generated. Mm -hmm. I, found, I found ways to, to generate a user, but I ran into SE Linux issues. And it's like, okay, so there's two options here. I can disable SE Linux, or I can spend 60 bucks on a book and learn SE Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing the safe thing because you got to remember, this is Cody. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to learn SE Linux. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, w we did like the traditional SE Linux restore con commands to like see if we get like these us user generation system D services to function and of course they don't work and that's basically where I left off uh, left mm -hmm. off a, a few months ago on this project <laughs> but yeah. uh, that that's really it now another project is a newer project that I'm messing around with because mm -hmm. uh, this next image is out is going to be like my dot files the distro Mm -hmm. because you know uh if DistroTube can do it i can find a i can probably find a way to do it with you blue mm -hmm. uh so uh this one i'm actually messing around with like the actual image template uh that mm -hmm. that the you blue team generates mm -hmm. and the only issue that i the only realistic issue that i have on this right now is uh the github cosine keys mm -hmm. <laughs> uh i follow the directions and i still can't get them working <laughs> <laughs> gotcha yeah yeah that's definitely one of the challenges um and it's something that so i was the one along with uh ben sherman um that worked on the image templates uh section and it's definitely been one of those interesting things where there is definitely a desire for us to make that an easier process because Ultimately, we would like to see more people being able to base their projects off of Ublue and then just kind of being able to build their own Bazite or build their own Bluefin. That's kind of the idea. There's a lot of legwork involved with making that happen. And one of my desires is to actually improve the documentation around that. It's something I'm actually looking at doing right now. I took a little bit of a break just because like I've had a lot of life stuff going on as well as, uh, you know, 
everything else that goes on. So like, it's one of those things that I'm coming back to and I'm actually working on cause I had created a video for my Fedora 40, um, or sorry, the Fedora flock presentation that I did. And everybody's like, didn't you, aren't you going to post that on YouTube? And I'm like, I got to figure out how video editors work and I'm going to do that, you know, at some point and get that to work. So if either one of you want to help me with that, I would very much appreciate, you know, as far as the editing and stuff is concerned, just because I can shoot the footage, I can get everything. I just need to figure out how to do it. So I do, this is something I do want to make easier for sure. Well, um, uh, Thankfully, we do have a previous episode of this show where we talk about content creation on, on uh, Linux Linux based systems, and mm -hmm. and we do discuss video editors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my disdain of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, they're they're all uniquely terrible in their own way. Yep, <laughs> I've been working. I've been working on figuring out how to do DaVinci Resolve in particular, because um, I was uh, given a key for the previous version of it, which figures out a lot of it. Like it's a it's an expensive software. Otherwise, if you don't just get a get a key from somebody, so that was very nice of them to be able to do. Because I had said, yeah, I do want to try to do more content creation on Linux, and I want to try to along with our extensive docs that we have, I do find that people really resonate with video based content. I mean, that's literally how I found the project because I'm not always the type of person that just goes and digs into docs immediately to try to figure things out. So, um, so I definitely have a desire from my own personal feelings that I want to try to see if I can, you know, create some video content around this um, and make the image template easier to use. We just wanted a minimum viable thing put together so that we can, you know, show people the model. But I think that I actually have an issue in the issue um, for the image template. Um, which is talking about the idea of including an ISO workflow, an example workflow of how to do it. Because I also was one of the contributors that helped with getting the, uh, the Anaconda ISO stuff off the ground. Because originally, <coughs> when I joined the project, it was our biggest problem that we actually didn't have ISOs initially yes. when I joined well, the project. Um, well, or we did, but it was experimental and hardly worked and I that's when the you part guys published where i am in, i was involved so <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i remember that first iso you guys published it was literally just a grub boot menu as to what image you wanted to install yes. and like yes yep. this is exactly what i wanted life <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't exactly the the best yeah. at what it did like i was and involved it couldn't <laughs> right. be any better <laughs> And like, like the thing is, is what's, what's so crazy about this space. And I'll, and I'll go into a little bit because you are definitely struggling with stuff that we struggle with too. It's not just you in regards to the SC Linux stuff that you run into. Like we had a change from 39 to 40 where certain things broke with SC Linux that we had to fix in order to be able to get our images to publish properly. And like, also we have been working on a tool called rechunk, which is a way in which to shrink the size of our images because Bazite is massive right now. And now it is not because of rechunk. Oh. And um, that has been a hugely beneficial thing for our update size, as well as the size of the image on disc. Uh, yeah, that you need you, you, uh, you need to like send me information on that because it turns Rechunk? out that my HTPC that, yeah. So I yeah. I found like this Docker I I found like this container image that mm -hmm. actually uh builds images for you. Uh, I think I found that off of like the old ISO builder script. Yeah, um, and that's that's what I've been messing around with. And mm -hmm. my HTPC image is three and a half gigs in size for just the yeah. ISO. And I'm like that is huge. Yeah, because I think yeah. Because, like, LibreL is only, like, 700 megabytes. And they're like, where's the bloat? <laughs> it's because it's because of the base main, base main image probably has a lot more than you actually need in there. Like, so here's here's one other thing that, I, that I'll talk about and something that we've been pushing upstream about. Um, 
So full disclosure, I work at Red Hat. I actually, as my day job, I work, I don't work in this part of Red Hat in the um, boot C, bootable containers space. Um, I work as a Ansible technical account manager. But um, as far as like Red Hat is trying to solve a lot of these problems for enterprise customers because they, um, in technical preview right now, have a project called um, Image Mode for Rel, which is boots boot C based rather than um, uh, completely RPM OS tree based. So it's slightly different Yay. where you can you can run both together. And it's it's kind of one of those things that it's hard to explain, but Bootsy is basically the next generation of RPM OS tree is what it's designed to do. It's going to work together with DNF, which is your traditional package manager that you use in Fedora, like traditional Fedora workstation. So people don't have to use, you know, RPM OS tree commands, which was kind of put together as a way to, you know, like there are certain benefits to both projects right now. And so, but there's actually an initiative upstream for Fedora um, called the Bootsy Initiative, which is basically an initiative around how can we get bootable containers <coughs> into the rest of Fedora? Because upstream's pretty crazy where it's got, so you got the atomic desktops, which are OS tree based. You have core OS, which is OS tree based. You have um, uh, cloud, Fedora Cloud, I think has some OS tree based images in there. I Maybe not. Um, uh, then I believe if I'm not mistaken, the if nothing else, the uh, open shift they're open shift. Yeah, they're based, based on, on OS on Red Hat CoreOS, which yep. is essentially uh, Red Hat's version of Fedora CoreOS. Right. Would be the yep. best way to explain it. But then you also have Fedora IoT as well, which is yeah. another project, which is like the way that they've described IoT is it's supposed to be an even more stripped down version, um, you know, of of CoreOS for for you know embedded systems. So. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting because we're we're in a transition period right now in the technology where um, we have noticed a lot of these problems, you know, from a technological you know perspective in the sense that like updates are large. That is one of the drawbacks of this system is that you know sometimes if you haven't updated for several months, you will have you know, three to four gigs of changes that you that you have to pull down, which is similar ish to like an Android phone, you know, where if like you've ever downloaded, that's an AB root style thing, which is slightly different than how OS tree functions. But it's kind of one of those things of getting to that mentality that, you know, your updates are are your differences between your image and that's what you're pulling down. So Rechunk is a tool basically that Antheus, one of our contributors to Bazite designed, and he's also the developer of HHD, which is another very cool utility that we ship with Bazite Deck, which essentially allows you to be able to modify controllers, um, that sort of thing for like an HTPC. You can also run the deck image on there as well, which just boots into game mode. That's kind of the main difference essentially is that it ships some additional software, a bit more drivers to support you know, handhelds and that sort of thing. But Rechunk is basically our like solution currently to this problem of update size is that, you know, um, you can look at the documentation for it. I will probably, I am not probably the best person to describe exactly how Rechunk functions, but it, he has an amazing write-up in the readme. It's probably one of the best readmes I've ever seen for a project. I'm like so pleased. Like we, it's something that we've, that we've shared, you know, with a lot of people saying like, this is a way to help solve some of these problems. So uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I got the link for Rechunk here and I'm looking at the readme and it, it checks it checks the boxes of something I'm actually interested in right away because mm -hmm. the very first thing it does it explains what the heck it is. There's a lot of projects where it's just like they just go straight into installing it. It's like what does it mm -hmm. actually do? <laughs> yep. Uh, we got uh, change logs, results, time cost. So talking about the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we we've got 
an an explainer on the on its logic algorithm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it talks about the differences uh, and the issues, and at the very bottom, there's a TRDL. TLDR. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, uh, TRDL. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but yeah, uh, I'm gonna look at I'm I'll I'll mess around with this here and just uh see see what it does. Uh, yeah, is it already is it already installed on Ublu images? Um, so we have been mostly utilizing it for it started with Bazite and then we I don't remember if it's fully merged into Bluefin or not. Um, there's a lot of um, workarounds and things that need to be done in order to be able to get it to work properly. So. Like it's ask as many questions as you would like, as far as Antheus is the best person to talk to, as far as trying to get it. Cause I know that there was one other guy for his custom Bazite image that he wanted to implement rechunk. And so Antheus got a lot of great feedback basically um, on getting it to work in a, in a project that's not just one that he directly contributes on. So it's definitely one of those things that if you are interested in rechunk, it's it's basically what we're utilizing along with um, hopefully Z standard chunked, which is another way in which that we're hopefully going to be able to decrease the size of updates is that it will um, do the changes rather than um, uh, rather than just pulling down the entire image, um, because if it invalidates one layer at the bottom, then it's got to pull everything. So that's like, again, one of the challenges of the container format for, um, being the delivery mechanism is that, you know, um, your updates can be quite big, but with rechunk and Z standard chunk, that's hopefully going to be a thing where it's less of an issue. And honestly, for users, like the only people that are really paying attention to the up are people that are like we have automatic updates turned on by default the reason and and some people have said don't do that and we said why like (laughs) the benefit the benefits in my opinion outweigh the cons and the reason for that is like okay we have automatic updates on you reboot your computer and it doesn't work properly Okay, all you do is boot into the previous version or just do an uh you know a simple command to roll back and you're back to where you were before. And you can say, "Hey, I had issues with this specific version. We also have command line tools to help with, you know, rebasing to a specific, you know, point in time because we keep 90 days of images at least. I think it's even more than that because GitHub just doesn't prune stuff which is crazy to me but it's like sure we'll take it like that's awesome so i mean yeah uh, let's see here how how many how many uh renditions of htpc do i have because this image is uh pretty old at this point Mm -hmm. uh is there a counter oh so probably manage all versions uh i have 10 pages worth of versions so yes github does not prune (laughs) (laughs) and that's great right like that's that's super awesome yeah because if you look at the so yeah if you looked at the tagged version yeah you have 479 untagged versions which are yeah uh so for (laughs) silver blue main which is on ublu's repository the oldest version i can find is 2023-0302 which means second (laughs) of March 2023, which is a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you can really roll back. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Do to you want to go all the way back? Sure. You know, like, that's that's kind of thing. Now, there's dragons with doing that because you're probably going back several versions of Fedora at that point. Like, you're going yeah, so from 38. Fedora 40 to probably 38 at that point. So your mileage may vary with, you know, rebasing backwards like that, but my theory should uh, work in theory. theory. It doesn't always, (laughs) but you know, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the pitch essentially is, you know, the reliability, the stability, and just personally, my view on it is that, 
computing devices have gone this direction for a reason in the sense that the reason why our phones operate the way that they do is because of that reliability and that ability for, you know, technologists to be able to push out these experiences to users to be able to get like, like the most popular device that people use for computing is their phone. And that is something that can't not work like, <laughs> and so like that is kind of the thing is that, you know, we're, we're taking a model that essentially like is, is with Chromebooks and, and also Apple is going this model as well. Maybe not like the image based model, but the way in which that they do their updates is kind of very similar, you know, specifically on iPads and stuff is just that AB root, but this is slightly different than AB root, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of the thing. Like, I think you're definitely going down, like if you're interested in playing with the technology and trying to figure out ways to break it, like you said, I think going the custom image model is a very awesome way to go because you learn the ins and outs of how it functions. And that's the reason why I built my own image. I actually built like a fork of Bazite kind of initially. And then I was like, this is way too much work. I'm just going to rebase my image completely off of Bazite. Like, yes, it sometimes includes some packages that I don't need. Yes, I, but, but the reality is, is the, the amount of work that's being done on the project to save me a whole bunch of effort, in my opinion, is completely worth it. Like, so... Well, uh, for context yeah. for you, Noah, you're talking to a guy who has daily driven Gen 2 multiple time, times over the past uh, six or seven years. So I, I understand how much work goes into generating a, a, a usable desktop, mm -hmm. uh, probably more so <laughs> than like your typical Arch Linux user. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I know I know a thing or two. And it is it's, and the main the, like the main reason as to why I don't typically daily drive like these systems myself is simply because like i run into something and i don't understand how the system is configured so mm -hmm. like uh th the main reason why i don't uh necessarily run like debian anymore on like my servers is because uh the the, the debian uh, minimum install image uh is a cli environment mm -hmm. and my biggest frustration with it is actually the networking stack that debian is using Mm -hmm. It turns out that they're not using a daemon. They're not using network managers. They're not using systemd networkd. Mm -hmm. Instead, what they're using is a custom-made systemd service to manually call I IF up and IF down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which and, that's uh, that's a challenge, right? That, like, that, yeah. That, that and uh, it took me forever to figure that out because how long has been has everybody has like Red Hat and Fedora. And basically all the other uh, distros. How long have they been using Network Manager? Mm -hmm. How long has that... Ubuntu been using NetPlan on servers? Which right. Is, which is the equivalent of the Debian minimal image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just like, why is Debian doing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it took me a while to figure that out. Uh, mm -hmm. When uh, Pipewire first was coming out, I had to figure out. Uh, generally, like how to configure Pipewire, which not even the Pipewire documents told you how to actually configure mm -hmm. Pipewire. Mm -hmm. uh, they do now, but that but I have to go through and do it all over again because uh, I don't have two or three audio devices. Mm -hmm. I have twenty six, and uh, yes, Pavu Control does exist. I mm -hmm. I recognize this, but Pavu Control is not enough. To manage as many audio devices as I want to manage. Yep. <laughs> There's a reason That's why right. I hand wrote my own wire plumber configuration because it was worth it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, and I yeah, and I think I think that's like a big thing, right? Is that you know this is a this is a different way of doing things. Like I, I will not lie to you in the sense that that has what has turned off a lot of traditional Linux users away from, you know, atomic based systems is because like 
in the beginning, the decision was made to go with OS tree. And then there was a decision made to you RPM OS tree, which goes away from traditional DNF package management and goes away. You know, it, it, it's everything is container first in the sense of like flat packs, which aren't a container. They're an OS tree artifact, but tomato, tomato in the sense that like, you know, you can set it's things a, up. It's with an isolated box. environment. That's what right. it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like, it's kind of one of those things where I think for me specifically, like why I see this as being the future is because like we're converging closer and closer from a technology perspective where Red Hat's interest in this, and this is my own view, not a view specifically of Red Hat, but like my own view or my own take on it is that Red Hat is like saying like, okay, yeah, people don't like this RPM OS tree thing. They don't like, like, like if we're trying to sell this to traditional, you know, sysadmins, we need DNF. We need the traditional tools that they're used to using. The only thing now that we need to teach them how to do to bridge the gap with their developers, because everything is moving towards containers, at least in the cloud side of things and development side of things and application deployment side of things is we need to teach them how to utilize a container file, which George, you know, has said multiple times. It's like a container file is not that hard to learn. I actually, when I joined the project, like I barely understood how container files work. And now I've been working with the project for, you know, a little over a year. And it took me like probably a couple months to like really get super comfortable with how containers work. Like it's not that complicated to write a container file to get it to do what it is that you need to do. Yeah. But you just got to put the legwork in in order to be able to do it. It's like learning any new technology. And that's, that's kind of the big thing for me is that like I – Again, my desire is not to convince everyone. That is the power of open source and the power of Linux is that, man, if you want to do Gen 2 and you want to build your own damn thing, you know, <laughs> and and do all of that work and you want it to be exactly the way that you want it and have those micro adjustments, more power to you. The people that I want to target are the folks in particular that just want their computer to work and just not to break, you know, that they just want to have a reliable system that they can use every day that has a lot of sane defaults already there for them and it holds their hand and just it functions. And like I said this in my talk when I, um, when I talked uh, um, at Fedora, maybe not in the talk, but in the hallway track, as what I said was, is that all gamers care about is that, number one, their video games work, and number two, that they're getting all the performance out of their computer, the, all the frames that they can possibly get. That's all they care about. And that's like what's been so fascinating about the Bazite crowd is that we have brought a lot of people who have never heard of Linux, ever, in their entire life, they're like, what, what the heck's this Linux thing? And brought them to Bazite because Valve refused to release SteamOS and make it available on their desktop. Like, Which, I don't, I don't blame Valve for that, really. Because uh, th they, they built and targeted SteamOS for, for, uh, the, Steam for the Steam Deck. Deck. Yep. And, you know, uh, yes, Holo ISO does exist, and mm. it works, but you, you see like the issues that people have with Holo ISO. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't see Valve ever wanting to support the desktop landscape because yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> like... you, you have to remember, not everything is going to use an AMD Ryzen APU. Uh, you might deal with like uh, this, the random guy who's still running an NVIDIA SLI setup from 10 years ago mm. or, uh, you know, the guy that has like three different brand GPUs uh, in his yep. system, because why not? Or, you know, mm. the guy that. Or, you know, uh, the guy that doesn't even have a dedicated GPU in his system. Instead, what he's using is one of those external GPU docks that you have to you have to work on supporting that. So uh, I don't I don't blame Valve for not releasing the generic image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at uh, the end of the day, let's remember, even Valve uses OS3. Yeah, and uh, that that that's a that's like the beauty that i find behind like the the whole selling line behind the atomic desktops is that everything's mm -hmm. containerized uh you're you get what you're supposed to get mm -hmm. and uh 
you you can have more faith that what you're going to get works simply because it's built into a container and it's and it's verified before it even gets to me that it works or at least it's supposed to be verified it makes uh, I don't it makes <laughs> testing a lot easier like yeah. the container builds it's probably going to work like <laughs> yeah that you know that said when i was first stepping into like the realm of the atomic desktops i was one of those guys making the parallels to uh to like many of the issues that I personally have had with uh, projects such as Nix OS, mm-hmm. which I don't know how familiar you are with Nix, but mm. uh, for 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 the uh, for the audience here, uh, Nix OS had you'll you'll hear a lot of this a lot of the same things said about Nix OS. the The key difference is that with Nix OS is that you have a configuration file with their mm-hmm. own special programming syntax and language yep. that you have to write out and hope and pray that they remembered to document what, <laughs> what it is you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, and and, and I, I am familiar with Nix. And... Yeah. <laughs> the, the biggest issue that I ran into with Nix OS is that I know Linux. Mm-hmm. So now I have to learn Nix. Mm-hmm. And... and Figure out how to translate my Linux knowledge to Nix knowledge, which yep. you barely and can. That, yeah, which, which you you barely can. And mm-hmm. when I was first delving into like these project, uh, these uh, atomic images, I, my very first experience, I'd never heard of Ublue. Mm-hmm. So uh, I I had I had to figure out how to enable RPM Fusion because you know I wasn't completely sold on flat packs yet. Uh, so. Yep. Figuring that out was an adventure and a half because this was before RPM Fusion told you how to configure it. Mm-hmm. So now we have to figure out how to manually set up a DNF repo- or not DNF a YUM repository. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, we 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 had to figure that out and yep. how to manually do it because you know we couldn't just do like DNF install. F- uh, here's a link. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, nowadays you can do that with RPM OS tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a heck of a lot easier than it used to be. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, then I had to figure out, oh, how, how do we install, like, packages on this system? Because, you know, our, mm-hmm. uh, the RPM o- OS tree main page wasn't clear at that about that at the time. Mm-hmm. We're talking about this was early days with, with mm-hmm. Silverblue. And, yep. uh, you know, uh, th- that was my very first time looking at, at that. This was, like, three, mm-hmm. four, maybe five years ago that I looked at this. And, and yep. then... You know, I kind of just dropped it because, you know, I, I was not necessarily the power user that I am nowadays. Mm-hmm. It was like, okay, we're done with this. We're done with this because, you know, uh, we're just going to go back to normal person Fedora because, you know, uh, we can't use our tried and true Debian stable like we used to <laughs> because, you know, we bought we bought the 5700 XT GPU and Debian didn't ship a new enough kernel for it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, and, and and that's like the same way that I felt about Universe, or not Universe Blue, uh, Silver Blue when it initially came out as well, is that like when I initially looked at it, I was like, what what exactly is the use case here? Because like this was also back in the days when they weren't delivering things in a container format either. So like this is when they were building like raw OS tree and then you would pull down the OS tree um, utilizing, you know, that way of doing things. So like the OCI container stuff is only within the last few years i mean george would probably know the history better than me um last a uh, year and a half year and by now three quarters like i remember yeah, probably about two years ago at this point right yeah about two years ago i remember joining yeah. uh the ublu project in in more of a watcher capacity mm-hmm. uh in february of last year and by that point, mm-hmm. I don't think if it was, it was, uh, I think for more than a few months. Right. Yeah. I mean, like the OCI container, like I said, I don't know exactly the timeline of when that came in there, but I think that that is when things really flipped on their head and it made sense because now if you're able to deliver things in a format in which like, like Docker has been around for a while, like the concept of containerization is even older than Docker. Docker just kind of popularized the idea of it. And so like, what's what's so fascinating to me is just how things have exploded and i think like the major difference between what makes universal blue 
you know, what it is, is because Fedora has specific limitations that they set on what things they are willing to ship. Not like, that that's a bad thing. And that like, is ag- not a bad thing. Uh, like, they, 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 they explain this to you. If you go to, if you go to uh, getfedora.org, they explain mm-hmm. to you why they make the decisions that they make. Yep. And uh, they, they are perfectly reasonable. I actually agree mm-hmm. with everything that they say in that. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, I understand that there's going to come with caveats. Like, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. hardware acceleration codex mm-hmm. uh, on uh, AMD systems. Yes, that could be an issue. Or, you know, the NVIDIA right. driver. But... Uh, that I don't think that Fedora deserves any hate for for no. what they get for that at all. No, because I you, I don't think you, they should. You no. have to remember that you know if you're going to be shipping like a a codec, well, for, first of all, uh, do me a favor, dear listener, and before you send us the angry email, <laughs> explain to me the licensing for H two sixty four, please, and then. Try to explain how you can legally license and distribute H.265, please. Because I guarantee you, you're not going to figure it out. <laughs> it's but, a challenge, for sure. Any, anyways, uh, we are coming up on the back end of the show here. So, mm-hmm. uh, of course, if you would like to support the production of the show, we have a Patreon. Uh, it is patreon.com slash no tux allowed. Uh, Big Pod, did we pick up any subscribers? I forgot to check. Uh, I didn't check either, but I don't think so. Well, uh, you know what? That's fine. If you want to throw us a couple bucks, you can you can do that. You get a higher quality audio feed because, you know, that's all we realistically can think of putting on there. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, there's a separate funding tier because, you know, it, it turns out that one of these days I would like to at least meet Big Pod and give him a big hug for doing all the work that he does for this show. It's just that Big Pod lives on the opposite side of the world from me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it turns out that that requires funding and uh you know i can probably fund this myself but you know i'd like to do it sooner than i can do it myself (laughs) and you know it'd it'd be nice to you know if i'm going to go to europe i I at least want to spend a month there because you know it's probably going to be the only time in my life i go to europe (laughs) (laughs) and uh you know i'd like to be able to pull big pot over here and give him an american vacation show him show him the world of corn (laughs) (laughs) Or you know, uh, at, at, you know, introduce him to like proper car culture and all that stuff too, because you know it turns out that we can actually modify our cars here. But anyways, <laughs> if you would like to send us some feedback, uh, you can send all your angry emails to contact at tuckspace dot com. And uh, these uh, these episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. So YouTube dot com slash at no tucks allowed. Give 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 us a. Uh, give us a, a subscription there. You know, hit that like button. Maybe drop a comment too, because you know we uh, we post there purely so we can reach you, the audience, better. But our universal source of truth is our, on our own website. Because you got to remember, at the end of the day, this podcast is almost one hundred percent self-hosted. All of our content is under our control. Uh. Our universal source of truth is at show.tuckspace.com slash at NTA. That is a podcast instance that we host on a server that I personally pay for. Yeah. And And I maintain. Yeah, you maintain, and sometimes I go in there and I run a DNF upgrade. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, hopefully not break things. I haven't broke anything yet. Uh, But anyways... Uh, if you would like to reach uh, Big Pod or myself individually, uh, we have these wonderful links right here. Uh, Big Pod, hopefully you remembered to fix yours. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, his, his, gonna try to remember. Yeah, yeah, you'll see like these at tenleyj at fostadon dot org uh, links link for me specifically. Those are for your federated instance, your Mastodon images, uh, or if you're using Twitter threads, you can even follow us from there uh, too. Instagram threads. It, it's it's Instagram. Okay, it's Instagram threads. I'm sorry, I don't have an account on these services. <laughs> but uh, we've also got YouTube links for our own individual YouTube channels. Uh, Noel, uh, if you send your contact information to BigPod, he'll have a separate slide right here with your with how to contact you. Uh, sure. Or, you know, you can even just tell, tell us to the uh, audio listeners who are probably driving their cars right now and probably don't want to actually, you know, uh, 
you know, uh, read show notes while they're driving. That's probably pretty bad. <laughs> That's probably pretty dangerous. I would not recommend that. So, um, yeah, as far as where to find me, um, universal-blue.org is the main website for all of the projects. Um, there will be links on the, each of the individual ones. Um, so that is probably the best place to look. I will also go ahead and yeah, I will send over a copy of my link tree, which should have a link to everything else, like where to find me, my own personal website and everything else. So feel free to get in contact me. I'm one of the people that admins the universal blue discord as well. So feel free to, you know, reach out to me there. So, um, very thankful that you guys gave me the opportunity to be able to record with the podcast. It's uh, very appreciated. So, um, yeah. Um, and for anybody who needs help, just ping me on discord. That's a brave statement, sir. That might come back to bite you, but, uh, for now you can ping him on the discord or, you know, eventually, you know, uh, they have a help section in that discord channel. You can just post in there too. Yep. And, As I uh, help is a good place to go as well, or any one of the channels. So, yep. But anyways, guys, uh, that's going to be a wrap for the show today. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, get myself a nice big old cup of ice water because it is currently 102 in this room. Uh, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Good. <laughs> but uh, I'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. See you, next. See you later. <laughs>